Hello, my name is Chris Snipes, and you are listening to The Melt. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated with the unexplainable. I read as many books as I could get my hands on and watched whatever shows that there were on TV about such things, but those were in short supply in the 70s. As I got older, I started scouring my school and town libraries for more books that I could devour on the subject, and then adolescence overcame me and my interests temporarily shifted to more worldly things. I stopped thinking about such things and sort of shelved them where they resided until the early 90s. I was living in St. Louis at the time, and as I began to explore the area more, I discovered various New Age bookstores and frequently found myself gravitating towards the occult or metaphysics section. There is where I found The Montauk Project, Experiments in Time by Preston Nichols and Peter Moon, which was a book about a series of secret projects that had to do with time travel, synchronicity, psychotronics, mind manifesting matter, and much more. The book helped to reintroduce the part of myself that I had shelved years earlier that was full of curiosity and open to exploring just how vast reality is and to the possibilities that that implied. Almost exactly 28 years later after the Montauk Project was first published, I now have a podcast and have invited Peter Moon on as a guest to talk about said book. I start off the conversation by asking Peter about his late co-author Preston Nichols and his role in all of this. Well, Preston Nichols was a phenomenal wizard when it came to technology and science in general. He was very gifted. He was, he stood out amongst his peers as a young person. Mm-hmm. And I know because I've, I've talked to his former classmates and he had a great aptitude for electronics, which went, went out the roof when he was in his teens. All of a sudden one night he, he came back and he had just a, a sudden knowledge of this. And his father verified that for me. Yes, indeed, this did happen. So he was one of the foremost experts on electromagnetics in the world. And that included all aspects of vacuum tube technology, which was later replaced by transistor technology. So Preston had, um, he also had an aptitude for the paranormal and he was investigating telepathy in the seventies. And he found that his experiments were interfered with routinely in the afternoon. uh, And he eventually got a uh, radio detection finder called an RDF. And it was a very big one. And he tried to see where the signal was coming from. And it took him all the way out to Montauk Point at the eastern end of Long Island, about two hours away from his house in East Islip. And and that's how he began to discover the Montauk Project. Interesting. Uh, and how did you cross paths with Preston? I was recommended to meet him because he was a prolific inventor who needed help with his marketing of his devices. And I was in the design and advertising business at that time. I had my own company with my wife. And uh, I, some friends of mine told me to go visit him. He uh, and I went to the psychotronics uh, meeting. The, it was called the uh, Long Island chapter of the United States Psychotronics Association, held in Farmingdale, New York. And I went to that meeting and I met him. 
and he said, uh, I'll have to wait to the break to talk to him because he was going to be in a panel discussion that night on Earth Changes. And during that lecture, he talked extensively about the Philadelphia Experiment, the Montauk Project, um, with uh, the head psychic involved in the project, Duncan Cameron, was also on the panel. And next to me in the audience, which was a small audience of probably 20 people at the very most, if that, was Al Bielik, who was a participant in the Philadelphia Experiment and Montauk Projects as well. So I began to hear all this fascinating story. Uh, and I'd never heard of any of this. And I thought it, I'd heard it for the Philadelphia Experiment, thought it was utter nonsense. And then when I began to get the you know, some sort of what I felt was inside scoop, it, be, it began to be tangible and real. And that was my introduction to Preston Nichols. And it took me about six months of going to those meetings and interfacing with, interfacing with him before I uh, felt uh, it was appropriate to go forth and, and do a contract with him and, and to write the, the Montauk Project. And before we get into what the, the the Philadelphia experiment entailed and how it it was connected to the Montauk project, what exactly are psychotronics? Psychotronics is a word that the coinage of the word is attributed to uh, Ingo Swan, known as the father of remote viewer viewing, remote viewing, and at a conference in Prague in 1972, it was the first conference. Uh, and, and psychotronics refers to the interface between electronics and the mind, body, and spirit. The interface, how electronics interfaces with the mind, body, and spirit. And this is not necessarily something that you're going to go to a trade school to learn, right? <laughs> you kind Most of just... definitely not. Most definitely not. Um, you, I mean, all of this stuff was, you know, in the secret sector. Or, or private sector where it mixed with the secret sector of, of the government. So yes, and, and where it all sort of, from one perspective, it began from people who were exposed to radar had mood swings and mood changes. And, and anybody who was experimenting with radar from the early days onward would notice that it affected the uh, emotions and psychology of the people operating in or around the radar. So this is, from one angle, that's how uh, you know, how it started. So what, what, I mean, what are, what's an example of the kinds of things that you can do with psychotronics? Well, you can change the moods of people. You can like, if, if you adjust radar and expose somebody to a radiation field, you can affect their, their mental state, their emotional mood. And you can, uh, I mean, these things were studied empirically uh you know this does this to people that does that to people and and of course they experimented with animals and you know we have video video footage of of birds going absolutely nuts in at montauk in the vicinity of active live radar it could and then we have then all of a sudden they go completely still so this has all been documented by different people and uh that you can affect people's minds and moods and emotions with, with electronics. And so, okay. At this point, what the, the Philadelphia experiment preceded the experiments at the Montauk base, right? That's correct. The Philadelphia experiment was, um, was the Navy trying to experiment to make ships appear invisible to radar because if they, because, because a lot of ships were being sunk in world war II in the Atlantic, and if they could make the ships not registrable on to Nazi U-boats, then they're going to be free from, or relatively free from being sunk. So that was, that was uh, one of the agendas. And as Preston Nichols said there, when you have a big project like that, and uh, huge aspects of the, the Navy and the industrial, military industrial sector were, were called upon for this Philadelphia experiment. Uh, they, they created what was called the, what was it called? The steel penny and pennies. Like when I grew up in the fifties, every once in a while you get a steel penny. It was not a copper penny and it was legal currency and they made steel pennies 
to save on the copper because they used the copper to experiment with the degaussing of the coils. Degaussing coils. Degauss, Gauss is, is a, re a reference to magnetics, a measurement of magnetics. When you degauss something, you are stripping the magnetism from, in this case, the hull of the ship. So if it was demagnetized, it would be not registerable on a, uh, on a radar screen. That was the idea. And uh, they got more than they bargained for with the experiment. <laughs> Which, which say uh, so. What, what, what ended up happening? According to various accounts, the uh, ship disappeared. The ship disappeared. It was out of the space-time continuum, and the sailors aboard suffered a lot of physical, mental, and emotional trauma. Some of them bursting into spontaneous combustion wow. flame. Some of them coming back disoriented severely some of them being uh, amalgamated into the bulkhead itself when things came back. So they were stuck in the, the hull of the ship or the wow. side of the ship or the bulkhead, which is a wall of a ship. And, and uh, it was a brutal experience. And this began a long involved, after the war, a human factor study to study why, why the mind of man was so vulnerable to electromagnetic fields. And, this is a long research that was conducted, uh, taking the sailors who had been at Camp Upton, which is on Long Island, which was in the vicinity of an old Nazi compound in the 30s, known as Camp uh, Camp Upton was the was the World War One convalescent hospital. This is where they brought them, but it was right next to what was called uh, Camp Siegfried, which is where the the Nazis in America is, in America used to go step. And they had a Bavarian hamlet out there, and it still exists to this day. The old Bavarian house where they have town meetings. And up until the 80s, you had to be German to live there. And wow. that finally had to be discontinued because it was racist. So you had a very strong German contingent in Long Island. It was the biggest uh, German contingent uh, tied to Germany and the Third Reich outside of Germany itself. And it was right next to Brook, what became, Camp Upton became Brookhaven National Laboratory, the premier atomic research laboratory in the world. And, and so the sailors were brought to Camp Upton and then they studied them in conjunction with Brookhaven Labs up until the 50s, at which point, uh, according to Preston's research, they, Congress ordered them to cancel the project because it could, was too, too dangerous it could control the minds of congress potentially and it went then underground to montauk to montauk new york which is at the eastern end of long island at a, a old world war ii camp known as camp hero and they had a huge radar dish out there which uh operated at approximately 435 megahertz which was uh the window frequency to the human consciousness it could really get in there and penetrate uh, people's minds, moods, feelings. And that, that was how the project uh, evolved out of the Philadelphia experiment, uh, went to Brookhaven. And, and because I alluded to Germans, there was a lot of uh, Nazi research that was put into that work because the Nazis had experimented with uh, human, humans on many different levels. Do Dr. Joseph Mengele and, of course, the Allies, and these people who worked had the access to the captured German documents and also the work of Victor Schauberger, who was uh, a scientist who had, was crucial to building the Nazi flying craft known as the Hannibos, uh, was one of their, uh, their flying saucer craft. And, and, and that's kind of where Montauk evolved out of. Well, isn't when when the, when the it was an aircraft carrier, right? In the Philadelphia experiment. No. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a destroyer escort. Gotcha. And a destroyer escort is is a water. I mean, it's much watered down than a destroyer. So it's uh, you know it, it's not uh, the most dangerous of, of sea ships, but it's certainly capable of defending itself to a certain extent. Well, when it disappeared, when they were doing the Philadelphia experiment, didn't it supposedly? At, during the time that it was gone, appear 
in Montauk in a different time altogether? Well, it was reported to have appeared off the coast of Norfolk, Virginia, as oh, okay. well as Montauk. Uh -huh. um, the more conventional, uh, I guess, stories would say Norfolk, and it's also Preston said it would appear off of Montauk, and, and in a more, um, and eventually appearing out of time at Montauk in 1983. This, this was um, the most sensational aspect of the story. When they were experimenting with time at Montauk, there was a whole connectivity between the two projects, um, which is not that far-fetched. If, you, if you're going out of time in this dimension, it's sort of like, why do things connect in the dream state? You could have uh, experiences of synchronicity where you might you know, run into six people named John W. Smith in one day, and it's like there's and that's that's a not the most spectacular of synchronicities, but things begin to connect out of time because we exist in more than just this dimension. So when things start, so if you get out of this time, you know, you're going to be more prone or in resonance with other factors that are out of time, and this is essentially what happened with. Uh, the experiments with Montauk. They got, uh, they, they, in fact, it was intended because the director of the project, John von Neumann, who uh, was, uh, was preparing, preparing them to meet in 1983 and uh, is believed to have not died as popularly believed in 1957. And was, was thought to survive and carry on the research. Uh, whether he did it or not, I don't know. Whether he did it in this reality or in another reality, I don't know. But there certainly is a lot of information uh, to indicate and corroborate that such a project did exist. Exactly how it occurred is more debatable. Um, but it definitely, as they say, I've spent uh, you know, 28 years of my life uh, reading, researching, and learning and writing about it. And so, I mean, the, the, the Philadelphia experiment took place in 1943, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was the connection to 1983. And then later in the book, there are things that have to do with 1963. What is, the, what is going on with the 20 year intervals? Well, this is very interesting. Good question you asked. Okay, so I will explain that the experiment of 1943, uh, it was learned, was part, and then and then the Montauk project. Okay, that that the Philadelphia experiment is known to climax on 12 August 1943. The Montauk project is 12 August 1983. It's 40 years between them. Now, every year from August 10th to August 14th. This is according to the research of Preston Nichols, which is not something he actually made up. It's something that he learned from different disciplines. Um, and it goes back to ancient Egypt, where this period were known as the high holy days of Egypt, sometimes called uh, uh, dog days in modern times, referring to the dog star Sirius because Sirius was most direct with the planet Earth. And this is why, and so uh, I think it's the Queen's Chamber of the Great Pyramid has, was directly aligned, so Sirius would shine in uh, into the Queen's Chamber through a shaft. And, and this was all because the Egyptians believed that they descended from Sirius. And there are many other studies, legends, and literature attributing the primary DNA of humankind to be uh, descended from Sirius, at least to a large extent. So this was known as a every August, the dog days of August is when this rhythm of the earth, and to understand what a biorhythm is, you can read about it online, but a biorhythm is, is like a flow of energy that in, in Traditional Chinese medicine, you have acupuncture uh, is associated with meridians and, and energy flows, uh, regulatory channels that flow through the body and are connected to an organ. So 
just as the blood flows from one organ uh, or one part of the body to another, so does energy flow. And the blood follow, flows along those energy uh, channels. So does the earth have rhythms. And if anybody you know, does a lot of gardening, and they want to plant with a full uh, with a new moon, and you if you get into rhythms with nature, anybody who's worked uh, or hung around bars where they have liquor, uh, you'll notice that in a full moon, the business will be excited. People will become very emotional and sometimes very crazy. And so these are biorhythms, and it's it's a sort of tangible but intangible aspect of life because life is not something you can put in a box that's one of the greatest characteristics of life it's not boxable and when you do put it into a box it will um, eventually revolt and undermine uh, against that effort so basically which with the biorhythm the, the strongest biorhythm was said to occur every 20 years uh, and on this august now there would be a less strong biorhythm uh, on the 10 year and even lesser yet on the, the annual anniversaries of August 10th to 14th, but the strongest one was every 20 years. So we had August in 1943, and then we had in 1963, there was um, a project that Preston was never able to find out en enough about to his satisfaction, but it was called the ITT Brentwood Project. That's a colloquial name. ITT was International Telephone and Telegraph Company, um, which was the, uh, you know, tied to Germany. And, and it was also, Brentwood is a, uh, a town on Long Island. It's probably a little over two hours to, uh, to Montauk. And this was the forerunner of the Hart Project. They had old big antenna farms out there. And I have uh, verified that independently with somebody who, who knew quite about it, who worked, who, know, who knows a lot about the stuff that was going on out there. But it, it doesn't really have any of the great sensation, uh, sensationalist stories attached to it like Montauk does. But that was the, the Brentwood project. And then in 2003, uh, of course, when the Montauk project was then uh, 15 years old as a book, uh, we were very excited to say what's going to happen on August 12th in 2003. So what happened there was very interesting. Um, Al Bielek, who was Preston's colleague and had participated in the Philadelphia experiment uh, with Duncan Cameron, he said, that, um, he said that there would be a blackout on Long Island. Or no, he, just, he didn't say when, where. He said a blackout on Long Island between a blackout he just had a blackout between the 10th and the 14th, a major blackout between the 10th and the 14th. And he said this on the Coast to Coast radio show, uh, which was actually set up to ambush him and denigrate him. But he made that prediction while he was being denigrated. And sure enough, on August 14th, there was the biggest blackout in the history of the United States, if not the world. And it was centered around Preston's new property, in Cairo, New York, which is about 45 minutes, mostly south of Albany. And it, it was centered around there, extended all the way to, to Montauk, up to Canada, and as far west as Ohio. It was a huge blackout. And uh, that, that was, that was uh, August 2003, but there was also something happened that was even more spectacular than that, but I wouldn't discover it for about four years later. And that was, there was a big chamber uh, discovered beneath the, what's called the Romanian Sphinx in uh, Romania. And I ended up uh, learning about this. I didn't even know there was a Sphinx in Romania. I eventually published the book. It's called Transylvanian Sunrise, where there was a ancient chamber discovered there that was full of modern-like holographic technology with... Um, with uh, where you could actually look back into the history of mankind and see it holographically. Wow. This is a fantastic discovery, a fantastic claim, but then we learned that that was even more fantastic. And, and to answer your question even more expansively, the next 
event will be 2023, which is only yes. three years away. Yeah. And I've recently done the astrology on that date. And uh, I, I don't consider myself an astrologer, but I, I gave this to one of my friends and I told her what it meant. And she says, you're, you're better than me. She's a professional astrologer on this particular subject. And so anyway, um, it's August 12th, 2023. Well, and this is very, um, I guess what you'd say positive compared to what we're going through right now with this COVID-19 yes. uh, event, a uh, uh, crisis in, uh, what is it, May of uh, 2020 right now. If we look three years ahead to August 12, 2023, we have in, the, what, what, in the, as the astrology chart is where the planets are is called a kite. And it's called a kite because when you connect the planets, you have at least four planets which make a kite formation. It looks like a kite on an astrology chart. And at the top of the kite is the planet Neptune. And Neptune is commonly in uh, astrology is often associated with illusion, deception, like the ocean appears one way and then it can change. But it's also the higher octave of spirituality. And in this sense, it's very positive because it's augmented in the kite formation by two very powerful outer planets. Pluto, Neptune, Pluto and Nep Pluto and Uranus. Excuse me. Neptune is being augmented by its two outer brothers, Neptune and Uranus. I mean Pluto and Uranus. Why can't I get my planets right? <laughs> that the outer planets are are the most powerful, and in um, in astrology you can uh, determine so much by those outer planets, but and they, they tend to be more generational than individual. So in this case, Uranus represents uh, unbridled creation, unbridled creation, powerful creation, innovation, technology, and Pluto represents transmutation and force, uh, transmutation, relentless, ruthless transformation. So you're going to, tra when Pluto comes, it's like a drill sergeant in the military is going to transmute you from a, a chump recruit into a, you know, killing fighting machine who, you know, a kick-ass soldier, whatever. That's what Pluto does. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to turn you into a, a killer, <laughs> but it, it changes you. It transmutes you. So you have transmutation and you have innovation moving us in the direction of the highest octave of spirituality, which ties into this, this Romanian technology, which is holographic in nature. And right now there are visual, there was visual technology being developed as I speak, which will uh, approach that technology in Romania. And it will be available commercially uh, for people to produce commercial videography, for lack of a better word. And uh, they're working on what would be called the Photoshop version of it so that somebody could take it and use it. Right now, the, the technology is not in a user-friendly Photoshop, I put that in quotes, version. So that's, this is like, in, in that technology, I would imagine that that will be online in three years' time. And then uh, at the bottom of the kite are the planets Mars and Mercury, which are conjoined or they're conjuncted which is they're at the bottom of the kite. So they're like at the bottom of the kite pushing up. And Mercury means communication and Mars means power and force. So, and these are all in alignment with the planets Uranus and Pluto. So you have a lot of positive there. Another aspect of the chart, which is independent of the kite, is the planet Venus with the sun is squaring Jupiter. and when it squares Jupiter, Jupiter is an expansive planet, and because Venus is in Leo, it represents children, and, and the sun as well. So it's going to mean that these, it's going to expand the childlike nature in a way that will help people to grow out of their childhood. And we're talking spiritually here. So there's a lot of childishness, childishness that goes on 
all you have to do is watch the news. You watch anything, any media, and you see extreme childishness. Yes. So this is a chance for people, but it's going to, you know, kind of make people grow up fast. It's like being thrown into the water where you sink or you swim. So this, this is a very positive time um, that will accrue in 2023. And I'm, I'm very excited to what it might represent in my own work. I will be dedicating an article on it in my next newsletter. Be Fantastic. writing about it next month. And that would be the Montauk Pulse. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yes, I have a newsletter uh, which is um, accessible. It's by subscription. The uh, skybooksusa.com website, skybooksusa.com. I also have the time travel education center.com. Cool. I will definitely put those links into the episode notes. Uh, you, you've mentioned Duncan Cameron's name a couple of times, and I know he's a very key player in all of this. What, what was his role in, in Montauk? Duncan was a very unique and gifted individual who suffered a lot as well. His father uh, had a double identity. He was uh, involved with the military, particularly the Coast Guard, but he used to smuggle spies in from Germany. He was known as Duncan Arnold, and also known as Duncan Arnold. He had an identity in Germany as Duncan Arnold. This was according to the research of Al Bielik. And he was also tied to a, a famous department store, which nobody hears of anymore, called Arnold Constable Department Store. So Duncan, um, Duncan was in Vietnam, where he was involved in, I guess what you call secret type projects over there. And when he came into, uh, he, he once came into Preston Nichols Laboratory in 1984. This was after the Montauk Project had finished and he wanted a piece of equipment fixed. And when he started to talk to Preston and they started to work together about Montauk, there was a, a great, Duncan could key into it and he, he could tell what was going on. He took him out there and Preston, Duncan was able to pick up stuff that he shouldn't have known. So he was very psychically attuned to this project and it, it developed a great rapport between Preston Nichols and Duncan Cameron, they worked together and they discovered that Duncan had quite a role in the project. One of the most interesting things, interesting corroborations of this is that they had uh, recognized that Al Bielik was Duncan's brother. This had come up in their own research, discoveries, readings, and then they never said anything to Al and they did not know him very well. They only saw him at, at psychotronics meetings, annual meetings in Ohio. And then one day, Al Bielik saw the Philadelphia Experiment movie, the, the one that was uh, distributed in video by uh, EMI Thorne. And, and after he watched that, he triggered a lot of memories for him. And he realized that he was Duncan's brother. He called him up and told him. And called them both, both up. And, and they said, yeah, we know that. But we weren't going to say it. We were waiting for you to find that out. So th this was a very strong corroboration uh, that there was something to all this uh, and their associations with it. So Duncan Cameron was uh, somebody who was put in a, what was called the Montauk chair and were crystal receivers that would pick up what he was reading. Uh, and and he, would, he, could, he could also think things that would be amplified through different processes and procedures, one of the devices involved was called an amplitron, and it would amplify whatever he was thinking and send it out and broadcast it off this huge uh, radar transmitter at the top of a big banana peel radar dish. And, and it, was, um, it would send out for affect the whole town and even up to Connecticut. It was very influential and animals would go crazy. Uh, people would go crazy and this sort of thing. And, and this is who Duncan Cameron was. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And, and Cam, the name Cameron keeps popping up too a lot. <laughs> when I first began, when I, the first night I met Preston Nichols, um, he told, he, he talked about the Wilson brothers 
And he said, that actually what had happened is he talked about the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment, and said it was released by Thorny MI, uh, the famous electronics company. And he said uh, that, that, um, that Preston, or that Duncan and himself were Preston and um, Preston and Marcus Wilson in a previous life, and that they were the manufacturers of science, the first manufacturers of scientific instruments in, in England, and that the company that they worked for or created was done in conjunction with the father of Aleister Crowley, the famous magician. And they formed a company that eventually evolved into Thorny MI. And Thorny MI released the Philadelphia Experiment in video, VHS format. So this was this very strange, weird connection. And that, that very night that I met Preston and he told me that, because the first thing out of his mouth to me when we talked at the break was about the Wilson brothers. And I went home and studied Alistair Crowley's book, The Confessions, looking for any reference to a Wilson. And I found the name Duncan Cameron and that Duncan Cameron was his best friend. Of course, it was a different Duncan Cameron. And I proceeded to find all sorts of strange coincidences between the Camerons and Alistair Crowley and the, uh, the, the Cameron brothers. And this is in the book Montauk Revisited. This is why I wrote a second book, because I, I wasn't going to put this in the first book. Uh, the first book was the story of the Montauk Project. This began a what, what I call is an occult investigation. And there, it's very important to stress that there were two investigations after we finished. And I've, I've shared some incredible tales and in what I've said here tonight. But so when, when I set out to investigate it, I wanted to verify if it was true. And there were two lines of investigation, which I've outlined and summarized very succinctly uh, and precisely in, in the silver anniversary edition of the Montauk Project. And written 25 years after the original book, which also includes word for word the original book with annotations and additions that could not be put in the original book at the time. So in, in this pursuing these, this association between uh, Camerons and Crowley's, I found out that Alistair Crowley's real name was Edward Alexander Crowley. And furthermore, that the names of Duncan Cameron, his real name was Alexander Duncan Cameron, and Al Bielik's name already previously identified independent of what I'm talking about was Edward Cameron. So there was an Edward Cameron and an Alexander Cameron. So they fit right into this sort of Crowley Cameron sandwich. And this began a long uh, myriad of synchronicities between the names and associations of Cameron and Crowley. And it, it, it went on and on and on until I discovered uh, that there was a woman named Cameron who was the wife of Jack Parsons, yes. who was the, 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 the magician who worked with Al, Al, Al Ron Hubbard, and they were working with Aleister Crowley-type magic uh, to incarnate the goddess Babylon. And Marjorie, so I saw that he had a wife named Cameron, and it didn't give any first name or last name, it just gave Cameron. So I said, who the hell is this person? This is weird. So I set my sights on her, and I wrote to the head of Aleister Crowley's organization, Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, which at that time, the address was P.O. Box 7666, uh, JAF Station, New York, New York. And I, I wrote to him and a long letter uh, saying who I was, what I was doing. And, and, I, and I, the reason I wrote to him, because he had published, uh, excuse me, edited a book called um, Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword, The Collected Essays of John Whiteside Parsons. It was edited by uh, his name, Hymenius Beta was his magical name, not his real name, and, and uh, Marjorie Cameron, who was innocent Marjorie Cameron. Okay, so now she has a, a first name. And then uh, I thought that he might be able to help me connect. I saw that she was, by her description in the book, she was uh, pretty old and I didn't have much time to meet her if I was going to. So he, uh, I, I sent him the letter and put it literally in my mailbox and then took a taxi to the airport where I would fly to Southern California to, this is 1992, and 
uh, announced the release of the Montauk Project Experiments in Time to what was called the uh, National Publishers, New Age Publishers Retailers Association, which I had joined in order to promote the book. The book was brand new. And you go to a book fair, any book fair, you're not going to be able to get any sort of an audience. I mean, you're just there. It doesn't matter who you are, unless you can, you know, afford five or $10,000 for a booth, depending on what it is. And then you can sit there and spill it to the world. And people may or may not be interested. I was, because of this organization I joined and this dinner I was invited to, uh, I, I was uh, allowed to get up and give a one minute commercial for who I was and what I was doing. And I, I was able to talk about the book in one minute and boy, did I create a buzz. <laughs> I'm and, sure. and, and, and I was uh, already, I went on the map and at that meeting, uh, at that incredible conference. And I would say that, you know, there's uh, the Latin phrase they say, when you graduate carpe diem seize mm -hmm. the moment. Yeah. Well, you know, I was like 39 years old, I think uh, 39 years old when this happened. This, this was my carpe diem, diem moment in my life in terms of my career. Uh, and, it, and it was like, wow, seizing the moment, going to that conference. And then when I first walked in to that uh, Anaheim Convention Center, it was, I ran into a man named Christopher Hyatt, who's a very famous occult author and an occultist and and but he didn't he, he was uh dressed in he looked like a biker he was not dressed uh like anybody else in in the, in the place he was just like a biker and he and he and i i said and, and there was all these books on the occult and Aleister crowley and magic that he was manning the booth for and i i said look and i'm looking for marjorie cameron he says he says go to mystic fire video uh and, and ask for bill he knows her Oh, great, great help. So I went and I, I bird dog that booth for, for about a day before I, I met this guy. And so we get to talking and I tell him who I am, what I'm doing there. I meet all of his colleagues, but I'm waiting for him. And finally, as I'm talking to him, uh, I finally realize who he is. He's the head of the Aleister Crowley's Ordo Templi Ori Orientis, the, the, uh -huh. the occult or He's the head of it. He's the guy I wrote the letter to. But I didn't write it to a name. I wrote it to a, to a, uh, official title, and it was it became obvious who he was. Of course, it's not going to become obvious to anybody, only because I'd studied X, Y, Z, that I, I knew, you know, I could identify him. And, you know, he says, that's, that's fine. He says, yeah. He says, just please don't, just please don't share that. You know, I mean, who he was yeah, on yeah. the internet now. Anybody can find out who he is now. Sure. But, but the, the thing is, is that uh, he was very gracious with me, uh, he does not have a reputation for being gracious if you read the internet, but that's beside the point. Uh, <laughs> um, he, uh, he said that he knew her and that he would, uh, he, he read the book. He read the book that night and he called her and she agreed to meet with me. And she, her phone number ended in 6606. Uh, I was so excited. I went and met with her and spoke for four hours. And, and then at the end of the conversation, I said, I really don't know why. I did mostly listening to her. I said, I don't really know why I'm here because I said, the only reason I pursued your name is because I, I had studied this, these synchronicities with the name Cameron and Wilson and all, they all led to you. Can you tell me? And she says, well, she says, all I can say is that my real name isn't Cameron, it's Wilson. <laughs> and she says, L. Ron Hubbard is also a Wilson. Wow. And his name is a Wilson. And it turned out that Hubbard was... Hubbard's father, Harry Ross Hubbard, um, was born as a Wilson, and he was adopted by the Hubbards, and they were both from Iowa. So when I went back and, and told the, uh, the outer head of the OTO, and I told him this, and he laughed, and he said, ah, they're both from the same batch. And uh, so, so that was interesting, and that became a whole focal point uh, of, of many other, that was the occult investigation. And that occult investigation, because there was also a, uh, what do you call it, a journalistic investigation, which was independent. And the occult investigation led me to the revelation, uh, following the names Wilson and Cameron again, uh, that there were, as I, I saw in a book by a guy named Wilson, that there was a pyramids, a camp hero, where the experiments took place and that the, 
the, the family, the Indian family who took care of these Indian pyramids were the pharaohs. The, and they descended from Egypt according to their own tribal stories. So there, there, were, there were pyramids and pharaohs at Montauk. And, and this was a whole, so I wrote another book, The Pyramids of Montauk, to explain this. And this became a uh, very, I guess what you'd say, long cascade of, of revelations. The journalistic in investigation was very important because the journalistic investigation, and I, I didn't realize until I, I wrote this book and summarized so many of the other books uh, concisely as possible, um, that so much of the journalistic inve investigation was done with Preston Nichols himself. I didn't really realize or remember, but we took so many trips out there and he was video graphing so much. He had a video camera that I, I had purchased for him and he was, he was putting videos together and documenting, wow. you know, so much before the base had changed. I mean, it changed. Now it's a state park. There was a whole trial that took place where he was ticketed. Him and Duncan were ticketed for being on the grounds and they fought it in court and won. And all of this eventually evolved into Camp Hero becoming a state park instead of a phony state park, which was really had a government operation being done on it. We, we saw uh, Cardian Corporation had radar out there where we were seeing the animals go crazy. We have that on video. And we were able to corroborate almost every claim of what he said about the Montauk project in terms of maybe we didn't have the exact, we, we, he uh, documented that there were illegal transmissions taking place out there. These are documented on tape, videotape. So it really set New York State on edge because this was a for three, uh, two thirds of the property, if it was a state park, which it claimed to be, needed to be available to the public. So we changed all that. Uh, much of the toxicity has been cleaned up as a result of what we've done oh, good. In, in terms of a government response, mostly generated through Bernadette Castro, who was the New York uh, commissioner of New York Park State, uh, New York State Parks. She was responded, she ordered one of the videotapes and, and uh, you know, did a good job as best she could uh, of, of cleaning up the area and restoring it to public use. So, but the only thing we couldn't corroborate journalistically was the time travel. Because to, to do time travel, you've, I mean, that's, you know, to do it, is, you know, it kind of lets, you just, it, it's not something you can easily show. So into my life and into our lives, actually, mine and Preston's 1999, August 11th, during that biorhythm, a man named Dr. David Anderson walked into our lives and he focused mostly on me because I was the writer, you know, the writer. And Preston's science didn't make sense to him. He didn't discount it, but it didn't make sense to him. He was a physicist and an engineer who would worked in the Air Force who had um, figured out how to keep satellites from falling out of orbit in space. And he created a space-time model and eventually discovered that you could warp space and time. And this was a long, involved research, which he, the Air Force was not interested in it, uh, so he left the Air Force and went into private industry where at some point the government sort of connected back up with him in some respects. And his technology evolved slowly but surely. When I met him in 1999, he could make time slow down or speed up in a self-contained field the size of a soccer ball. And he uh, went to Romania this, right before he met me. And right after he met me, he wanted me to go to Romania. He says, I want to, and it took him about eight years, nine years to get me there. And he, he paid for my first trip to Romania, where I have gone practically every year ever since and evolved a whole, um, I guess, team of friends and, and whatnot that have continued my research. And I'm, in some respects, I'm, I'm following David's trail. David, uh, I haven't actually seen him since 2010 when he appeared at Montauk at a symposium that I had helped uh, put together and certainly uh, had uh, enabled him to come, facilitated his arrival there where he showed us a 
prototype of his early time machine, time reactor, he called it, which could uh, make a plant, he showed us a plant growing in three minutes, which would normally take three days. And that's the only real footage I've seen of his time reactor. And, but he'd already announced just before he showed us uh, on the radio that he could now put people in and send people back in time. And wow. the, the technology had evolved to an incredibly advanced state. Um, he lectured on the technology. He didn't announce that. And that was 2010. In 2009, he uh, lectured in Romania uh, with myself, actually. Uh, I would, we would do tag team lectures, but he talked extensively about the technology of time travel. Uh, he felt it went over people's heads. He was a little frustrated with that. It took me about five years after he took me personally tutored me on certain principles, but it took five years for it to really sink in. And in, in the, the fifth year, 2015, I put together a article. First, it was an article, which he was very impressed with. He said, this is the first time anybody's taken the patience to break down what I've taught. And he says, I want to use this article if I may. And I said, certainly, uh, you know, when he's lecturing to people, whether it be a team of scientists or a bunch of students. So, uh, and then later I put this into video form to make it even easier to understand. And that's what the Time Travel Education Center was put up for. What anybody can go there and see seven free videos on uh, the math and science of why time travel is within the bounds of ordinary math and science. The only thing you need to understand uh, and this is eighth grade or below level, the Pythagorean theorem. And if you don't understand the Pythagorean theorem, you can look on a video somewhere else and it's very easy to understand. And, and that's all you need to understand, except you have to be patient and you have to think a little differently than you're used to. That time travel is within the bounds of ordinary math and physics. It doesn't require, require quantum physics or any heavy duty calculation to determine that it is possible and was within the ordinary bounds of, of science. So that was, that basically demonstrated beyond, you know, any mathematical doubt that what Preston was saying was on the money, even if it's not exactly, all aspects of it are exactly accurate, but the, the general thesis, and this is what, this is what the research of the Montauk project led me to was, um, the fact that time is a malleable commodity. The problem with time, and I did another series that's available, some free videos, uh, I think it might cost about nine or 10 bucks to, to watch the whole series, is the psychology of space time, which is, there's a mathematical model, which I used, I forget the guy's name, but he shows a mathematical model of 10 dimensions. But I break them down and describe them and add to that. In other words, each, and the first three dimensions are very obvious. The fourth dimension uh, gets into the concept of time itself. And the, and the fifth dimension gets into multiple realities, which is right out of the, the Twilight Zone idea. You know, the fifth dimension, I think they refer to it as quite correctly. So it, it explains all the, the and, and this is a, what I'd say a psychological approach to dimension or psychology of space time. In other words, the problem we don't have time travel is because of how we think about space and time. And the first thing is people don't understand the dimensionality of space time. And there are more dimensions. So this is why when people's minds go funny, it's called dementia because mm -hmm. their mind is gone, but it's also relates to dimension, which mm -hmm. is a measurement. Men, mention is measure. It's also the mind. So you, you have a measurement. And basically, that's the first step of understanding the psychology of space time is dimension. But then there are two other aspects. And one in this, I have not had time to do the videos. One is censorship, and two is power. And censorship is a big, big issue. And this is the, the greatest weapon of war is to censor information. Yeah. And, and you see it in the stock market, you know, censor things and, and uh, censors people's movements. And power is, is something that people cannot handle or deal with. 
so that's my soliloquy there. I went <laughs> no, it's fantastic. I covered a lot of things I was going to ask about anyway. Well, what is what is zero time? Well, zero time is a concept that Preston advanced, which is basically time that's you're not you're not in linear time. You're in time is still, for lack of a better word. In t- it's kind of like timelessness. Timelessness, yes. And he had what was called a zero time generator, which was, he called it a whirly gig. And it was actually, what it was, was a, I think it was a sort of gyroscope based. It was like a gyro, it was like a, I'm trying to think of a word for it. It was used to uh, balance an airplane like a gyroscope on an airplane. It was made by Jerry Sperry Gyroscope. And Sperry Gyroscope was a big contractor at Montauk, and it was in their basement where the United Nations first operated out of New York, in Lake Success, New York, on Long Island, right outside the border of Queens in Lake Success, Nassau County, Long Island, not far from where I live. And, and so Sperry became Unisys, now I think it's something else, but this generator was, um, he said it was correlated to the spin of the earth, which is what a gyroscope is. And, and, and that in turn was correlated to the spin of the galax- galax- the solar system in the galaxy. So it was plugged into, um, and in those videos, I talk about a lot about spin and how spin is what causes gravity. So you also would be tapping into zero gravity because you are, and it's, it's this contorting of space, which actually creates gravity. It's like, like when a vacuum sucks up a, a rag, it kind of sucks it up and it twists it. That's kind of what happens when a, when a body is put into space time and it, it begins to warp space and time. And there is, and there's a spin involved, and it creates gravity. Gravity has been studied far beyond my knowledge, both by Preston Nichols and by David Anderson. They could talk a lot about. I think he, David called it, a, gravity is a label on something we don't fully understand. But he's talking from the perspective of conventional science. I'm sure he understands it much better than that. Sure. Also in the, in the book, uh, it is said that uh, humans are born with a, a time reference point. What is that? What is that talking about? Well, I think when you are born and you're you're connected to the umbilical cord to your mother, there's a primordial connection to not only your mother's DNA, but all the DNA that put her into place. So your, your, your psychology, whatever state it's in, is tied to a primordial consciousness. When the umbilical cord is, is cut and you, know, you, you come out of the womb and umbilical cord cut, and in, in our modern society, somebody takes a notation of what time you were born. And th- th- you know, that becomes your astrology chart. That is your, your, your first time reference as a citizen. So you're put into a, a reference referential point and, and, and then you're living in a time until such place that you exit, you die, and then they put another date and time stamp on your death certificate. Uh, so that's your, that's your time reference in a, in a pragmatic sense, but it's also what you're, you're constantly referenced to. Um, you have a name, you have an identity, and most of us are generally in sync with the day-to-day aspects of existence. Some people are not. Some people are wired into different dimensionality. I certainly meet a lot of them. And it's not necessarily, I can't speak for everybody, but it's in many cases, if not most, people shouldn't be uh, indulging in I guess what you could say, ungrounded activity. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's, to be in the present moment 
is a, is a gift. That's why it's called a present. It's like be in the present moment and enjoy the present. I mean, this is what, you know, Zen Buddhism teaches. Be in the yeah. present moment. Be in the now. And it's not to say that there's not, there's not incredible things to explore. Um, but I've only been able to obtain whatever I've obtained, whatever value that has, and certainly has value for, for many people, is by staying in the moment and not, because I, I've, I've, I hear many flights of fancy and time travel by people who um, <clears throat> might be talking um, smack for all anybody can tell. They might be telling the truth. But I've always maintained that I could make up better stories than they do if I wanted to, but I choose not to. And, and the funny thing is, and I'll say this, when you start making up the stories, they have a tendency to become real. And I would share that one of my psychic friends once said to me, she said, I feel, I, and she, she was, she's a professional healer and psychic. And she says, when I'm the most psychic, whenever I'm the most psychic, I feel like I'm making it up. And that's, being creative. I mean, you're indulging in the process of creation. So if you start to um, make something up about somebody, you will influence them. And it's, it's like quantum resonance. Yeah, yeah. And that, so, so what I'm saying is, but I don't think it's, you know, you know, and, and sometimes I think when people start running off at the mouth about their experiences, um, thinking that other people will be interested in them, it's, it's not unlike going up to uh, a member of the opposite sex at a, you know, at a singles event, or maybe it's not even a singles event, and you just start running off at the mouth about who they are and what they are, and you're not necessarily even uh, needed or wanted to be in their space, you know, and, and this is these, these people often can't assess their audience. Yeah. They can't read the room. Well, exactly. And, 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 you know, does, does anybody want to hear what you have to say? Uh, you can always find somebody that hears what you want to, wants to hear what you have to say, but you know, you, you need to, uh, understand your audience and, um, you know, and, and, have your information appreciated and, and many times these people need uh, they need to be listened to in a therapeutic reference frame and, and people will they need to be they need to be heard they need to be listened to or they feel that they need to be listened to but it's more in the direction of help because it's not necessarily revealing yeah I could see that um, back for a second to these videotapes are they uh, hopefully they're somewhere safe hopefully they've been digitized are they, are they yeah they're i mean they are in such a secure website oh are, are all the videos online somewhere are you talking about no, the, the, the ones that, that, that demonstrate the, the science of time travel is that what you're talking about no i'm talking about the the videos that preston and you took at uh at Mont on the montauk base uh, I don't know if they've been digitized. I mean, I have them. Uh, it, it, there's no worry of them. But, but see, the, even this, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're at a state now where so many years passed. It's like nobody cares anymore. It's like, and Montauk has all evolved into um, what, what in, in my, my own work with, with what's going on in Romania and what's going on with... Um, the work of David Anderson. This is all super, supersedes what happened at Montauk. It's not that Montauk is insignificant, but it was like, it was an abortion of a project. And, and it and it's, deals with a lot of negative underworld stuff. So whether, and, and, and it's always going to be new to some people, but it's kind of made its splash in the, in the sun, just like the JFK assassination. I mean, people are still churning that. 9-11, you don't hear about it as much anymore, but people will still churn it. It's, these were big moments in time. 
uh, that, that affected the culture of the entire planet. Montauk is, 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 it also, is also an example, but it, so what's important now is more like say, the most important work I've ever done is, is putting these videotapes together uh, that explain the science and math of, of time. And it's like you can have you can have the top scientists of the world who will look and thumb their nose at it and won't even look at it uh, because they're, for lack of a better word, stupid. And it's because they didn't invent it. It's because, and, and there's, you know, who am I to put this up? You know, so it's like, it's ignored. And we even had, I was on a video, uh, what do we call it, a documentary last, uh, it was aired last August. I can't even remember the name of it. And I guess I was in one the year before that. And in, I don't even remember the names. I think this aired on the History Channel. They interviewed me for at least two hours on film. And they completely omitted me. Wow. Omitted me. Didn't even mention me, I don't think. I think and even when they showed the book, they cut my name off of it. I gave them permission to show the book, and they, they didn't put my name. Like, I, I don't exist. That's so and, odd. and so that was curious. Now that documentary, as bad as it was, people didn't like it unless they were completely ignorant of the subject. And then it was, it was just, it did a lot of stupid, I mean, it was very unprofessional in the way they handled the subject, but they're psychological. See, this is why the psychology of space time, people aren't qualified to be dealing with the information. Anyway, the documentary generated a lot of book sales. So that's good yeah. for me. I can't complain. Sure. Then I had another one which came across much more user-friendly, and I participated in this. They actually showed me in this one. And then they showed, they dramatically had it, so I revealed the, the patent for the time reactor, David Anderson's time reactor. I took it out of a briefcase, and I showed it to him, and I brought it to him. And then when they did the, they aired it, they did not, they showed it, but they did not mention Dr. David Anderson. I talked extensively about it. They didn't mention him once. They omitted any comment on David Anderson. And then they had Michio Kaku come on, and he said, oh, this looks like the scrawlings of a child. And he obviously, and he says, it has no power source. And without a power source, you can't do it in time. He's nuts. Or he's a liar. Because it describes the power source. There is a power source that Time Reactor provides. Uh, not infinite power, but as far as we're concerned, it's infinite power. It, it, it solves all the energy problems of the world. Sure. But of course, this is all suppressed. And, yeah. and, and, and so you have Michio Kaku, who's like up there lying his ass off. And, and this is what passes. So it's like, uh, it, and it's, you know, I, I don't take it personal, but it's like, this is how, you know, full of, full of bull. The, uh, the people who control the media and even beyond that, what people's gray matter is. It's like if, if you have a, a great discovery, and it's not my discovery, so I'm not that offended by it. It's not my discovery. It's, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to just ignore it. We're going to treat it with, uh, you know, no dis dispassionately. You know? So, so this, this, is, this is the... This is the way things are, and uh, maybe it will change. I mean, but, but the whole hierarchical uh, structure of, of the politics of, of this world or leave a lot to be desired, to, to put it very lightly. But, but if we fictionalize it and twist it a little bit and then make a Netflix series out of it, then people will pay attention to I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Now, there is a, you know, the problem with Netflix, it just, it doesn't even, it just goes into pockets. Netflix has become a black hole. And I mean, I don't watch Netflix that much, but it's, and there's one, I don't know if it's on Netflix, but it was a show called Dark. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking about time. And yeah. I saw the first episode, the first season. Mm -hmm. The second season lost me. I mean, it was just, yeah. it, it couldn't get into the second season. I agree. And it's, it's very weird and it's very hard to, to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
uh, my wife watched it one episode. No more. No, no, no. Too dark. Too crazy. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't blame her. And then I stuck with it more out of a professional responsibility. Sure. What we are doing is I did option the screen rights to Montauk Project for somebody who's developing this advanced video technology. And he was not developing this technology when I optioned the screen rights. This is something that came fortuitously to him because of his, then the reason I signed with him is because he's, if he's not the premier video engineer in the world, he could be, should be, or could hold his own <laughs> with those who are. So uh, it, I, I recognized his talent and I, I signed with, I never signed with anybody else. And, and, and the reason I signed with him is because I recognized his talent was, and, and just been talking to him. And um, he was not in a very good professional position at that time, but I, I invested in him and I believed in him and, and his career has only gone up since that. So we're looking, uh, I'm looking forward, if I look to the stars of something ready to bite on that, in um, in the fall, cool. And in, in other words, some sort of actual negotiation, movement of contract or something like that. And then um, I would expect by that beautiful date in 2023 that uh, there will be something to be consumed by the public. The problem is, though, is, is maybe positive or exciting. That is, is I don't know that getting people to recognize things recognize things does anything it's like who's recognizing what like in some respects and i don't mean to be insulting to people it's like you could go to the zoo and talk to all the animals you know what's the difference between doing that and talking to a bunch of people who are preoccupied with right now the covid19 crisis and and so uh you know right now the, the planets are putting the screws on the population of earth and it's this will be going on for a while this will be going on and, and it's going to sort a lot of things out and a lot of people will be hurt a lot of people will be helped and it's going to change the uh the dynamics of society nobody knows exactly how but it will change in other words the planets the planets have their own agenda and we don't we don't need to worry as much about People follow the planets. It's just the way it is. Just like you watch people follow the trends. They followed, uh, people went to World War II and they all put their hands over their heart and hated Japanese and America anyway. Uh, and then they, you know, my generation, most of them became hippies, you know, and, and, and they're following the trends in the skies. They're not hippies at heart. They're not Japanese haters at heart. Uh, they're just following the trends and, and they, then they become yuppies, you know, and then they're not yuppies at heart either. So it's like, it's, you know, people, people are very much followers in a sure. social sense. Yeah. It's much easier to be a follower. And you just, but you follow the times and then there will become people that come out and invent things and invent cell phones and develop cell phones and, and change the world. And it's just, it's just like a, a big, we're in what is called, a, and I explain this in the videos, a closed timeline curve. A closed timeline curve is the beginning and the end. It's, it's, like, it's, it's just like the statement from the New Testament, I am Alpha and I am Omega. This is, you know, time is, is one big loop. And this is very hard to conceive of. And the man who said to understand it the best was a man named, man named Kurt Goodell, who was a, a favorite of Einstein's and probably far more brilliant than Einstein. Uh, and he kind of went nuts over this concept. I mean, he had to be put in a sanitarium. So that's part of the psychology of space time. So it's, it's something for, you know, it makes us wrestle with our, our minds and whatnot. Sure. And you were talking about, we were talking earlier about time reference points when humans are born that would also, uh, be dictated by where you are in a planetary scheme of things too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's like, where, where are you born? It's, and it's, you know, it's like, when did you enter kindergarten? 
where, what school did you go to because of where your parents moved? There's so many things. Um, wh where did you walk in in your first job and what opportunities present themselves? You know, it's like so much happens by happenstance. Sometimes it's by design, sometimes it's by happenstance. So time is very relative and, and where you end up and how you end up is, it's kind of random. Not completely random, but there's a, there's a random effect. So that's when you're, you know, when you have a pair of eyes and you can see and you can go back and you have a brain. Now that's not necessarily the only way to have a brain, but when you join the physical universe, you signed up just like you signed up for the military. And when you're in the military, you know, you, there's a way out of the military and you can, and then you get in the military, you signed up, you can become a, a deserter, which can result in death. You can get killed, which can result, which is death. You can uh, get mustered out of the service as uh, what do you call it? The unfit and get a dishonorable discharge, or you can somehow get dishonor or honorably discharged, or you can become a lifer, you know? So it's like, but you're in the military and you're not going to escape it without consequences. Life is the same way. You've signed up and you can leave it dishonorably. <laughs> you can, you know. Leave it on your own terms. Yeah, you can leave it on your own terms. You can do the best you can. And, and so that's your time reference. And, and when you're done with that, just like when you're done with the military, for the most part, unless you're called upon, you don't really have to deal with that. I mean, you don't owe them anything anymore. You're done. And, and you can think in non-military terms and you can do a non-military job. So it's, it's that way with life as well. When you're, you're not depending on your identity and your body, you have a, a new playing field. Whatever that playing field is, is, you know, is a whole other question. But so, you know, and, and, and then it's not to say, just like in you're in the military, you can step out and have another identity. You can have a civilian identity, you could even have a work in intelligence and have a, a Navy identity when you're in the Army or vice versa, or have a civilian identity. You could be doing an operation. Um, so you could, you could have an identity outside of that. By the same token, in your existing life, you can have an identity that's outside of time that can theoretically surpass the boundaries of your ordinary perceptions but my only warning to that would be you know how good can you do it and what are you going to accomplish and and are you going to compromise you know your life yeah. to to do that and as they say in, in the story of the new testament um that's that's a, an interesting analogy you don't have to believe in it but you can look at it as an analogy because you have the the christ character who isn't really given too much about his time reference in the, in the physical plane. He seems to have so much, the way he's portrayed is all this ability and all this divine gifts. And he just kind of like, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an ordinary human being. I'm going to cash it all in or chuck it all in to give everybody a, you know, a hope. And that's, you know, so, you know, where does he stand? And Preston Nichols referred to, what did he call the, I think he called the Christ consciousness the original timeline. So we want to get back to that type of consciousness where you're not invested in the, the time reference of living with the Hindus called the wheel of life. You know, you're stuck on the wheel of life, which is not just one life, it's a series of lives goes on and on and on and on. How do you get off it? Well, that's, that's philosophical and that's interesting, but. Uh... I think one of the ways that I've thought about that you can get off is you just sort of, you realize the, I don't want to say the game, but you, you, you can see reality for what it is. You, you you realize that we aren't our identities. We're not our bodies. We're not our skin color. We're not our gender. Uh, and that uh, 
um, the nature of this reality is very co-collaborative and that we all play a pretty important part in that. And uh, it's easy to get sort of fooled by 3D reality, I think, thinking that this is where it all stops. It begins here and it ends here. And I think figuring out that there's much, much more than that may be the first step to either getting off this wheel or, or getting onto a completely different wheel. Well, what you just said reminds me of something very interesting in, in the second Transylvania book, Transylvania Moonrise, where as they describe the San Mandela ritual, the Tibetan San Mandela, and you've seen these, these Tibetans put together these elaborate uh, mandalas with colored sand. They're utterly beautiful. Yes. And then they just wipe it out at the yeah. end. They, just, they destroy it. And... What in, in that book is San Mandela is to create a, an extension of oneself. It, it's, a, it's called a yidam. It's a, it's a character that can interface in realities that the human body cannot interface with. It could look like whatever the lama decides or molds. You can even teach him how to talk. But the, the thing is, when, when you're, you know, a man, you know, this world, the way you were describing this, like conglomerate realities is like this whole mandala building and building and building, building. And then you can have an incident like the, the great flood described in the Bible, the fall of Atlantis, whatever you want to call it, a cataclysm, and it wipes it out. I once saw this in a, uh, near a coral reef in the Bahamas where I went snorkeling. And it was beautiful seeing all these fish down there. It was like, it was like better than, you know, SeaWorld or something, you know, and it's live. And I went back there a couple of weeks later, but there'd been a big storm and there was, it was completely wiped out. Wow. It was so disappointed. Where all that life go? It's gone. You know, Amazing. it's gone. That's what nature, that's a part of nature. Yeah. So every moment we're, we're alive is, you know, we're allowed to be there. And, but, but this whole thing of, you know, at some point, the San Mandela of aggregate reality will be, okay, done. It's like like taking a, a game of cards, a poker or solitaire, and just taking the cards and just, okay, that's done. We lost. Let's play a new game. Yes. And, and that's what, uh, that's just, just a part of life. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing permanent is change. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that uh, that seems like a pretty pretty good note to end on. I think so. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, although I barely barely touched upon my my question list, uh, but I'm absolutely fine with that. Uh, perhaps we can do this again. Um, if you would uh, tell our listeners um, where they can find you on the internet and where they can find your work and buy your books, certainly. Uh website for purchasing books and seeing what the books are is www.skybooksusa.com skybooksusa.com and then there's the time travel education center where you can learn uh get you just have to sign up enter your email and uh you will be able to watch seven videos free videos explaining the simple math and physics of why time travel does not violate the laws of math and physics and uh this requires a little bit of patience uh, for some but it's definitely there and it's not really i've never had anybody even try and refute the science or the math because it's so simple fantastic and the, is there a, can you subscribe and get access to more things there is a paid subscribership which has uh, in the time travel research center which has more information a, a more more description of the time reactor although the time reactor uh patent application is available and if you can study that you can read that yourself it's it's uh it's available to anybody i've made it available to anybody david anderson made it available to me but i i explain it a bit more there's there's a lot of uh i guess what you call proprietary information you can also look at the books i'm writing as they're written um and you know, if you're a paid subscriber. So, Fantastic. That, uh, and I'd like to have more time to put into this website. Right now I'm writing two new books 
Oh, cool. And, uh, that's a whole other story, but um, we'll get into it uh, at a, on a different occasion. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for agreeing to do this. I really enjoyed it. And uh, let's uh, let's try and make it happen again in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. That conversation was sort of like a, a dream that I didn't even know that I had come true. Um, it was a lot of fun to be able to talk about this subject matter or these these many layers of subject matter um, that really kind of brought me back into the metaphysical slash conspiracy slash paranormal world again. So it was uh, a great full circle that just uh, took place by this conversation happening. And I'm very thankful for Peter for agreeing to do that. There will be more. As we alluded to at the end of the conversation, he has agreed to do a series of podcast episodes on the Montauk books. Uh, which there are, I believe, six. So there will definitely be more parts coming ahead. And I'm very excited because that also goes into territory that I have not read about yet. So stay tuned for that. But between now and then, there's going to be lots of fantastic stuff coming up. Um, if you like the show, which I hope that you do, if you've made it this far, that says something, right? Um, there are many ways that you can contribute. Uh, the most obvious way would be financially. And you can go to www.patreon.com slash the melt podcast and sign up to subscribe for anywhere from a dollar up per month. And uh, that would help with just the monthly bills first and foremost that I have for the podcast. But I'm also looking to expand and make this thing more vast. Um, I really would love to have more time to put into it and to finesse it into the vision that I see it being, its potential. Uh, as it is now, I just don't have time to do that. I'm, I basically make my money doing other stuff uh, that I don't really enjoy that much, but it's something that I'm good at. So uh, if the work is there, I do it. Um, but I would much rather put my time and energy into this podcast to be sure. So Anything that you could contribute would be very, very much appreciated. And there are other ways of contributing besides financial. Um, you can also post and share links on your social media site of choice. Um, you can also leave good reviews and ratings on wherever you get the podcast, whether that be iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, so on and so forth. Any of those ways help. Um, yes. And there are also other ways that you can contribute. You can contribute content, too. Um, if you've listened to a good number of my episodes, you know that some of them begin with people's stories, usually having to do with similar subject matter that the rest of the show is about. Uh, and I'm always looking for more. So if you have any stories of things that have happened to you firsthand that sort of fall into the loose umbrella of things that I cover here on The Melt, feel free to send them to themeltpodcast at gmail.com. That would also be greatly appreciated. And I believe that is about it. I thank you all so, so very much for listening. I hope that uh, you are able to glean something from this, maybe even learn something from it. At the very least, maybe it just gets the gears turning in your mind and you begin to open up to the realization that this reality, quote unquote, and multiverse that we live in is full of intrigue and mystery and curiosities and things that just make one's existential jaw drop. Um, I find it that way, at least. Hopefully you feel the same way and that's why you're here. Anyway, Great, great episodes coming up. I know that I always say that, but it's always because I'm excited about the episodes that I have coming up. I really want to tell you what they are, but I want to surprise you even more than that. So thank you again for listening. And until two weeks from now, take care of yourselves, please.